Over the past videos in this playlist, we've built this, Pure Turing, which is a four symbol simple Turing machine that can emulate the 6502 microprocessor. I'm not going to say definitively that this is the simplest 6502 TTL build, but we must be getting awfully close. I think the bring up process is a bit like exercise. We all know it's good for us, but it's most enjoyable after the fact. But before that, I usually check to make sure there's no dead short in the power rail. This can be a nightmare on a printed circuit board, but it's not so bad in a breadboard bring up where you can isolate the power lines. After that, I usually do a visual inspection to make sure that all the chips are inserted the right way, and all capacitors with polarity are inserted the right way as well. That was all okay for this build, so next we add power and observe, and be ready to turn it off quickly if necessary. Before checking for functionality, I usually look at the 5 volt rails. The first time I applied power, I was getting 5 volts near the input connection, but on some of the chips the voltage was dropping below 4 volts. In the end, I just decided to bite the bullet and made a more robust power delivery system. Rather than just connecting everything with wires, I used these header connectors with some pins pulled out and I soldered in two wires to form the two power rails. I even used a small piece of Vero board for this particularly long jump. Now, this does slightly defeat the purpose of using breadboard, but it solved my 5 volt problem. Let's check the voltages again. I'll check it where the power comes in. 5.06 volts, that looks fine. 4.94, that's acceptable. If I can, I want to get all the voltages above 4.75 volts. Now, the circuit will actually run with a lower voltage. It just mightn't be as reliable, and those sort of bugs are really hard to find and fix. Once I'm happy with the power delivery, I then go to every input pin on every chip and just make sure that there's a voltage on it and make sure it's not floating. This is easy to do and it can save a lot of grief. Okay, now for the fun bit. I'm using an Arduino Nano to clock the circuit and provide reset. I'm going to set the board rate to 1 megabit and they're usually reliable at this speed. The first thing I want to do is just make sure that I'm getting a serial connection between the PC and the Arduino. I'll open up the serial monitor, and that looks good. As I normally do, I write a comment about the port connections, clock raw and reset. I'm also connecting up a bunch of other signals, such as write bar, data clock, serial data, etc. I'll explain these in more detail in a minute. But for now, these just help us tell what the machine's doing. I'll set up the data direction for both of these ports. I'll generate a hash to find for each of these port connections. This just makes the code easier to read a bit later on. I want a clean reset signal, so I'll raise it for 100 milliseconds, then lower it for 100 milliseconds. Now in the main loop, I'm going to raise clock for one second, then lower it for one second. Remember that the Arduino repeatedly calls loop, so we should see an oscillating signal at half a hertz. And there we have it. You'll see that the LEDs on the upper right are just the clock, and the colours even match the logic probe. In the last video, I said I was going to lay down the notepad memory to have a million addresses, each two bits wide. And this is exactly what I've done for notepad reads. For writes, I should just leave the space behind the EEPROM empty. After all, we can't write to an EEPROM. Instead what I'm going to do is mirror the SRAM. This means a write to location 0 is the same as the write to location 80000. I'll explain why I've done this in a moment, but let's first have a look at the impact of the wiring on the chips. I always want to perform a write when clock's high, and I can achieve this by connecting clock bar to write enable bar. I only ever want the EEPROM enabled during a read, so I can connect clock directly up to the chip select line. Also, I only want the EEPROM to output when NA19 is low meaning that we're in the lower part of the address range. Conversely, I want the inverted NA19 signal to drive the output enable of the static RAM. I happen to have a spare exclusive OR gate on the circuit, so I use that instead of an inverter. Why have I wired our notepad this way? Well, let's have a look at what's stored on the notepad. 
Remember, I said starting at location 0, we have a double dollar, followed by the status register. Then I have a number of variables representing the state of the CPU, followed by the system's main memory. At the other end of the EEPROM, though, at 7 FFFF, I have four dollar symbols, and this is the only place in memory where this occurs. When the Turing machine starts up, it starts at rule 0, and at notepad pointer location 0. What I want the machine to do when the notepad pointers below 80000 is read from the EEPROM and write into the static RAM. It then moves right, and I want the machine to continue doing this until it's found four adjacent dollar symbols. This will effectively copy the contents of the EEPROM into the static RAM on machine power up. As we transition from rule 3 to rule 4, the notepad pointer should be at 80000. This means for the first half million clock cycles, we should just be counting up the whole time. I decided I didn't have enough blinking lights on the board compared to other CPU builds, so I've attached some LEDs to some Vero board with current limiting resistors and a strip header. I'll start the machine running. Unfortunately, these LEDs are a bit too bright for the camera, so I've had to use this Perspec board. The LEDs are connected to the address lines and the notepad memory, so hopefully we should just see it counting up. Let's increase the speed a little. Yep, that looks like a binary up counter. That gives me some confidence that the rulebook and the binary up counter are both working. Speaking of the rulebook, let's have a quick look at its output. We have 14 bits for the next rule, a single bit for left right, and two bits for the right symbol. So this takes up a total of 17 bits. The output from the rulebook is actually 24 bits, so let's see what we can do with the remaining 7 bits. I'm going to make these special outputs, and strictly they're not defined as part of a Turing machine, but they're just outputs and they're not going to participate in the computation at all. I'll discuss bits 17 through 19 in more detail in an upcoming video. Bit 20 is mRead, and bit 21 is mWrite. I need a way to control these outputs. We previously had a diagrammatic representation of each rule. Well, what I'm going to do is allow each arc to specify these outputs. If they're not mentioned, they're presumed to be zero. Here we see the lower arc asserting M right. Now this happens very rarely in the code, but it just so happens that this one occurs on the arc going into rule 7477. Remember we'd previously used this to determine when a write was occurring. This means we can use this mWrite signal to detect when a write's occurring, rather than having to detect rule 7477. Going back to the schematic diagram, you can see I send these control signals directly into the Arduino. While I'm here, I'm also going to connect up to data 0 and data 1 from the notepad into the Arduino as well. Now what I can do is divide the circuit in half, and test each half independently. All I need to do to test the rulebook is tie the chip select line on the EEPROM and the static RAM high. The notepad itself will actually be kept on the host PC. Let's have a look at how this setup might work. We have the pure Turing breadboard on the left and a PC on the right, and they're connected by a USB cable. The USB is connected to an Arduino, which is basically waiting for an input from the USB port. The PC maintains a copy of the notepad. It reads from the current notepad pointer, then it exports this value to the Arduino via the USB cable. Then it waits for an input. When the Arduino receives this signal, it sends clock low. It presents the bottom two bits of symbol on the data lines. So in this way, the PC has effectively done the notepad lookup. It then raises the clock signal. After that, it converts the data lines to inputs reads the values and reads the values on the control lines. Then it sends this information via the USB back to the PC. The PC then stores this information in the notepad. Then it either increments or decrements the notepad pointer based on the control signals. Once this is done, the program in the PC and the program in the Arduino just loop back to the start. So what we're doing is using the rulebook on the pure Turing breadboard, but the notepad stored on the PC. This way, we can test the rulebook in isolation from the notepad. Let's start by programming the Arduino to do exactly this. The Arduino actually can clock much faster than the circuit can handle. 
I'm going to define this value, repeat, which is the number of times I want a port written to in a row. This will just slow the Arduino down a little. When clock's low, I want data 0 and data 1 to be outputs from the Arduino. I'm going to read in a byte from the serial port, but I want to make sure data is available first. Now I'm going to take the bottom two bits of the symbol that we've just read and output them to the data 0 and data 1 lines on port B. Then I'm going to raise the clock signal and turn data 0 and data 1 back to inputs as quick as possible. Finally, I'll read port B and send that value back out the serial port. The control signals, including left and right, are read in through port C, so I'll add them to the symbol before I send it out. Finally, I'm just going to change this while to an if, just so it doesn't block. Now I'm going to write some code that goes on the PC side of the connection. I've written some Arduino interface routines, which I won't show here, but they'll be included in the code in a link below. I need to hash to find the bit positions for mread and mwrite. This is the code I used in part 1 to generate the Pac-Man sequence, and this is the code that I used to detect when we're in state 7477. But this information isn't going to be available to us now, so we'll have to use the mwrite signal. All right, back to it. We look up our symbol on the notepad, and then we send this value to the Arduino. Then we do a blocking read from the Arduino, and it sends back the new data value, the direction, and some other control information. In this case, we're specifically interested in mwrite. First, we write the new data over the current notepad location. Next, we increment or decrement the notepad pointer based on the direction bit we read from the Arduino. Then, if the mwrite bit's set, we call write memory. While I'm here, I'll also make a read memory routine and check the mread bit. The main reason for doing this is that writes are actually pretty rare, so from a debugging perspective, I'm going to look for reads first. The first read's been found, and it's occurring at location 7AF5. For those who have watched the Turing 6502 playlist, you'll know that this is the entry point for Pac Man. This code took an awfully long time to run, so I'm not sure how far I'm going to pursue this strategy. But just getting to this point pretty much tells me that the rulebook's working. I have a decision here. Originally, I was going to test the notepad in isolation, but given how slow this code runs, I think I'm just going to try the whole system. If I run into problems there, then I know it's the notepad, and I'll test it in isolation. So let's go for broke and test the system as a whole. I don't have enough memory on the Arduino to mirror the entire static RAM, so I'm just going to keep track of the first 256 symbols on the static RAM. I can do this because the Arduino can keep a local copy of the notepad pointer, it controls reset and clock, and it gets to see the direction and write symbol coming from the rulebook. Because I keep this little mirrored part of the notepad, I should have access to the memory address registers and the data bus register. I'll just grab the code from the PC side that computes these values and paste it into the Arduino code. I send this address and data to the PC, and so I'm using this format that I've used in other videos. It's pretty reliable. And finally, I need to either increment or decrement the notepad pointer based on the direction information coming from the rulebook. Back over on the PC side, I need to receive the address and data for the write using the same format that I used on the Arduino. The lower six bits of each byte received contain data, while the upper two bits tell me where that data goes. When bit 6 and bit 7 are both set, then I know I've received both the address and the data for the write. Next, I check to make sure that the address is within the range for a pixel, and if so, I call write memory with the address and data. The excitement's building, we're getting close to the big test. I need to modify the write memory function so that it can accept address and data. I'll just move the code around because I'm a bit too lazy to make a declaration earlier. Okay, let's give it a crack. This is sped up a hundred times real time, but not much seems to be happening. Wait a minute, what's that? It certainly doesn't look like random memory accesses. It seems to be drawing a block. I wonder why it would be doing that. Let's keep it running and see what happens. Now it looks like it's stopped. 
Wait a minute. It started back up again. Looks like he's drawing a character. A zero. Hmm. Now it started drawing again. What's this? I think this is a one. So yes, our Pac-Man machine is working. This clip actually took an hour to run, so I'll try and generate a longer one for the next video. In case you don't recognise it, this image is from the emulator. Thanks for sticking with me, we're at the end now. The next video is going to be on one of the most important topics in computer architecture, which I think is very underrated. So don't forget to like, subscribe and share, and hit the notification bell to be reminded when the next video is out.